each of you here to our services at First Baptist Church. If you're visiting with us, we welcome you as well. And for those of you that are listening from home, you too are very much welcome to our service. We gather today as a body of believers, brothers and sisters in Christ. Our desire this day is to set aside all things concentrate on worshiping and giving praise to our Lord and Savior. So let us now set aside and focus as we prepare this day to worship our Lord. Father, we do give you thanks. We 
come before you on this hour, on this day that has been set aside, that your people can come. That your people can come and lift you up in praise and in prayer. We humble ourselves as children with the anticipation and the presence of your spirit as we come We do pray that you join us as we gather. For it is in the name of Christ we do pray. Amen. Amen. Let us now stand as we sing this whole night favor. Hymn 323. How great thou art. Please stand. Chapter 20, verse 12. Honor your father and your mother, 
so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God has given you. In the New Testament passage from Colossians 3.21, and actually you're going to read 3.20 as well. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In the 1700s, in the 1700s, William Cowper lived a life. In the 1700s, William Cowper lived a life and spent most of his life in deep depression. At age 33, he found himself within the walls of an institution for the mentally ill. There, within the asylum, he began reading the Bible. He soon found Christ as his Savior. Despite his emotional pain, or perhaps because of it, he began producing literary works of amazing insight. And in 1760, he wrote this hymn based on Zechariah 13 and verse 1. First time I heard this was not in church. I was in my early 20s. I've not been a Christian for just a few short years. But the words had an amazing impact still. Convicting power just served as a reminder of how much Jesus Christ truly, truly loved me. There is a fountain filled with love drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains lose all Almighty God, I also pray for my friends Emily and Jonathan who will be getting married later today, that in their excitement that they would be able to take it all in and enjoy it, and, and they would be honored to be able to perform that way. And for my friends the moms who lost a dear friend of theirs, Claire and Struggle, this past week, I wanted to send all for him there today as we continue to be with that family. Father, please watch our listen to this guy and protect. Now to stand and sing. 
Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out to the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the water are here, Isaac said, but where is the land for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the land for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place that God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He then bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars of the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed, because you have obeyed me. Then Abraham returned to his servants, and they set off together for Beersheba, and Abraham 
stereo in the field. Would you please pray prayer with me? Lord, please let the words from my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing unto you. For you are my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Anybody here watch Gunsmoke? <laughs> I love Gunsmoke. I have probably watched every episode of Gunsmoke. I think there's 728 of them. And then there's four movies. I've, I've got through one of the movies. I may have missed a few of the scenes, a few of them. Who, who, can, who can not enjoy Matt Dillon, um, James Arnett, Kitty Blake, uh, Kitty, Kitty Russell, Amanda Blake, um, Doc, Doc uh, Noble Stone, Festus Dennis Weaver, Chester, oh, Ch Chester, <laughs> Chester and Dennis Weaver, sorry. Anyway, Festus was, who was Festus? Some other guy. Anyway, and Burt Reynolds actually got his start um, in, in one of his big starts in Gunsmoke. Well, one of my favorite episodes slash scenes of Gunsmoke is when Chester is walking into the, to the, to the, to the, to the uh, jail and Marshall Dillon is sitting there sipping a cup of tea. And Chester comes in and he's wiping the sweat all off of him. And, he, and, and you know Chester, he had that limp that you know, his hair had forgotten when he was in the war and whatnot. And, um, and Chester looked and said, Mr. Dillon, what are you doing? And Matt said, oh, I'm a cup of tea. Is that cold tea? <laughs> No, Chester, it's hot tea. Mr. Dale, it's 107 degrees outside. And Matt says, I know Chester, but I read in the paper where if you drink hot tea, I guess the illness, whatever, actually help cool your body down and make you feel cooler. And Chester looks at him and says, are you fun of me? And he said, no, I'm, I'm telling you, he said, no, you're fun of me, aren't you? You're just fun of the arch, Mr. Dillon. He said, no, Chester, I'm, I'm being serious. Well, I'm going over to Long Branch to get me a beer. And Chester has a You'll figure out how to piss in the sermon here. <laughs> Have you ever wondered when you read some things in the Bible, when you think, is God fun of me? Can you imagine Abraham being told to take his kid and do what he was told to do? Can you imagine Noah? Have you ever heard the story of Bill Cosby's Noah? You know, in the, the YouTube one, when he, when he said, when, when God tells Noah to build the ark, and Noah's like, right, what's an ark? You know, and, and, and you know, and I think they were thinking of God, are you funny? I'm actually kind of happy, as much as I love children, I'm kind of glad children aren't here this morning because this is a very difficult passage to preach on. And I must apologize from the get-go here because as I prepared this sermon, I found myself frequently returning to God, pleading, please let the words from my mouth this morning and the meditations of my heart be pleasing unto my God. I share this because of the strong passion which I have on this specific passage. The history behind the passage, the disagreements between religions over this passage, and the various interpretations of those disagreements. Now, a disclaimer, Pastor Christie told me I did not have to preach on this this morning, even though it's next in her line of sermons. Um, despite it being next in her line of sermons, due to the difficult nature. I reminded Christie that the life and times of Abraham were actually where I centered the majority of my studies when I was in, when I was in seminary. And, and I never pass on the, and those of you that know me, uh, I never pass on the good opportunity for civil discourse, disagreement, and maybe a little controversy. Paradox is defined as a seemingly absurd or self-contradictory statement or proposition that, when investigated or explained, may prove to be well-founded or true. Now, imagine, if you will, that you and your family are enjoying time together, having a nice, got a nice grill going, Dubby's playing the guitar, maybe you're having a few cold drinks on a hot July day, and all of a sudden, you hear this voice from out of nowhere, telling you that the next morning you are to get up, grab your kid, take him to a specific spot, and sacrifice him. Take it in for me. Sounds like a good time, huh? 
That's exactly what I would say. I would, I would say, God, are you punning me? And I would say, are you kidding me? Now, I can't speak for you, but I can probably, but I can immediately go in, but if, but I would probably immediately go inside, ask Sherry to check my Bible signs, and not dare tell her what God just told me to do. I'm going to go out on a limb here and be able to know what else in this room would dare tell their spouses if this was the case in their life. In fact, I'm going to take a wild guess that Abraham didn't tell Sarah before or after the event, especially since she had Isaac at such an old age, and this was supposed to be the one with whom would inherit everything he had and who God has made his covenant with. The seeming paradox highlights the distinction between faith and belief. I don't have any doubt that Abraham had faith that God wasn't going to actually make him kill Isaac. But that doesn't mean that he actually believed it. Even in verse 5 of this passage, Abraham states to the two young men who came with him, stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there, and we will come and worship, and we will return to you. Or in verse 7, when Isaac asked his father, my father, behold the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb and the sacrifice? To which Abraham responds, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. I truly believe that Abraham is holding his breath here, hoping that God comes through. We know how the story ends. Abraham saw no lamb, reached out his hand with the knife to slay him, and an angel tells him, hold on. And voila, Abraham sees a ram caught in the thicket. By the way, just a little religious background here in history and controversy. Muslims believe that it was actually Ishmael that Abraham was willing to sacrifice his kid. That's another thing. Fortunately for Abraham, there was no Department of Social Services or Child Protection <laughs> Services to contend with. Sadly, the reality of that time is that neither children nor women had any of any of it. The passage of Scripture, this passage of Scripture opens up several opportunities for dialogue and interpretation. Some biblical scholars believe that Abraham was wrong by not challenging the same God that promised him Isaac and made his covenant with Abraham through Isaac. Some scholars think that Abraham was just plain us. It would certainly seem contradictory for God to tell someone to kill their kid, period, not alone the one he promised to make into a great nation. Paradoxes are all over the place. Granted, when we move to the New Testament, we had a lot of religious scholars stating that they thought this Jewish carpenter from Nazareth, God's only son, was also a lunatic. As the father of an only child, this passage has troubled me for years. While I can deeply respect the theme by some preachers and scholars to be that Abraham was simply willing to go as far as he felt that God wanted him to go, and more than prove to God that he was faithful to the end, I'll be honest, I do not think that Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son. I'll continue to be honest and state that this troubles me terribly. How many people misrepresent God in our society by doing evil things in God's name? The Crusades, the Inquisitions, the beheadings of people, bombings of abortion clinics, the various genocides around our world, the recent killings in Ukraine being blessed by a Russian Orthodox priest. The list goes on. These are not paradoxes. These are just plain acts of evil, using God as a means to manipulate others. How about local, state, national, and world leaders who are willing to sacrifice the innocent simply for the joy of power, many times using religion, and dare I say the sacrifice of well-being and innocent children who may just need basic human care for means of control and manipulation? This is not a paradise, my friends. This is pure evil. In no sane or just society would the God that I choose to believe in ever ask anyone to go through the sacrificing of a child just to prove a point. As we are all aware, the ultimate sacrifice for God, for humanity, was made in a place called Calvary. When a humble Jewish carpenter asked his father to let the cup pass, if it was his will, it wasn't. Jesus obeyed. He gave his life. God sacrificed God's Son. All God ever asked in return is that we believe. And John 3.16 is pretty clear in this regard. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, 
but an everlasting life. God's word continues in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, where the Apostle Paul stated, There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not let you be tempted beyond that which you are able to bear. Does God ask us to make sacrifices? Yes. Does God expect us to obey? Yes. Does God provide a guidebook on how to obey? Yes. My God, however, would never ask us to do what God was not willing to do himself. So here's where I get confused again. Having said this, because God's son Jesus paid the ultimate sacrifice for our sins, we can change the focus of our sacrifice to using the gifts God has given us in ways that please and honor God. Sometimes this is inconvenient. God never promised convenience. Sometimes sacrifice hurts. God never said that sacrifices would be easy. Ask any parent of a soldier or first responder. I've heard it said many times, if you ever want to give God a good chuckle, just tell God your plans. In the end, we fortunately don't have to struggle with any paradox like Abraham had. We do, however, need to be willing to trust God. The best advice I can give anyone on what that means is to spend more time reading God's word, all of it, not just the parts that are convenient, but especially the parts that are not.
the opportunity each and every day that we have to bring forth your word and testimony. But now we give you thanks that you have bestowed upon each of us the desire to give back to this church. We give graciously and generously of the provision that you have given to us. We ask that you accept all those gifts, both from the giver and the giver. Lord, we ask that you bless these, this offering. For it is in the name of Christ we do pray. Amen. I invite you to be seated for a few moments as we just briefly investigate things that are going on this week and next week within our church. As you are aware, since 2014, we have instituted laces for faces here at First Baptist Center. The monies that are generated from this giving provides our children in schools and our elementary schools the opportunity to have tennis shoes where they might not have the wherewithal to purchase those to participate in the athletic activities as part of their elementary education. Also, meeting tonight at 9, or on July night, which is this evening at 5 o'clock, 5.15, we'll be having a BBS meeting to plan for our upcoming, our upcoming BBS, which is next week, July 16th through the 19th. The meeting is at 5 o'clock tonight Tomorrow Heights Baptist Church. Tomorrow they will be continuing their studies on the book Freeing Jesus from 12 to 115. Any other announcements that need to be brought before the church at this time? Hearing none, I invite you to stand as Michael Williams leads us in our benediction. Let's pray. Almighty God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the freedom to come to the church and worship as we, as we deem appropriate. Thank you for the sacrifices that you have made for us. Please allow us to sacrifice appropriately as you would have us to do so. Help us not to hold back, but help us to listen carefully to you and to make sure that the sacrifices we make are truly in accordance with your word. Help us to love and help us to be who you created us to be, no more.